Welcome, closers, to another live crowdcast. I'm your host, Jordan Wayla. I have Michael Park here with me today, and we are going deep on fees and pricing. Everybody loves loves to talk about fees and pricing, but a lot of times those conversations are grounded in math. That's what we're going to do today. We're going to do some hardcore analysis. We're going to take questions from you guys. Welcome, Jason, Vanessa, Greg, Jeff, Eric, Kevin, Stacy, everybody else. Glad to have you guys on right now. Um, I do want to mention a couple of housekeeping notes. We're going to go for about an hour here. We're going to be looking at a fee analysis tool. If you want to get a copy of that tool, you can go to the Facebook group. There's a link to that down below. You should see a button at the bottom of your screen. If you have questions, please ask the questions where it says ask a question down below. We will go through those um, probably throughout, but definitely by the end. So don't chat questions, answer those down below. Um, Michael, give me some background. Why, why are you the guy to talk about this? <laughs> what, what do you, what do you know about property management, brother? Well, I'd say um, probably my biggest asset is the fact that I've made every mistake I think in property management. So, <laughs> and in business in general, um, you know, just real brief background between uh, just about me. I was a real estate attorney for eight years, basically running title companies all across a multi-state region. When the real estate um, crash basically cratered most of those um, uh, most of those businesses, we ended up reinventing ourselves and uh, ended up in a, after a few years in property management. Uh, built uh, built a nice little company down here in Dallas, uh, sold it back to our, our corporate entity. Um, there were quite a few opportunities during that time uh, that then I took a position where we were running on a um, uh, the head of national sales for an institutional um, manager. Uh, at the same time, we ended up having quite a few folks come to us and ask us how to, um, you know, on, on a, do some consulting on, on the side. And eventually that turned into a full blown consulting practice. Um, one of uh, the things we approach and how we approach things is I'm obsessive with um, just saving time and, and automation as well as finding the maximum fee structure because property management, it, one of the things that you find in property management because we are driven by numbers and a high, num high level of numbers, we are, the changes we make have an exponential impact and that goes not only for your operational efficiency, but that goes for your fee structure as well. So property management, you're either gonna win by inches or you're gonna lose by inches. And mm -hmm. all of those little inches are what matter. So um, I'm just passionate about it. I love it. I, I like to dig into the numbers, the math. Um, I like to break down operations, build them back up. And we've just had a great time doing it. We've seen some really great results. I mean, this is an industry that is lends itself to a lot of impact when you make the right changes. Yeah, absolutely. So I think you hit the nail on the head. The leverage that comes from adjusting your monetization model lends itself to having a disproportionate impact. Conceptually, why is that? Michael, when we think about growing by 10% more doors, reducing churn by 10% or collecting 10% more revenue, why is it that that monetization piece has such a disproportionate impact on bottom line profit? Well, it's interesting because even that we, we could even drill down and which we I, we you know we'll go through this tool in a little bit but we'll see uh, that even that 10 percent increase in let's say doors under management that 10 percent increase has an exponential impact on different fee structures in different ways so if it's a fee that's driven on a monthly basis to an owner that exponential impact is going to be by the number of properties that you're managing if it's a fee let's say to the tenant it's going to be your number of properties you're managing times the number of tenants and so sometimes that lower fee will have a bigger impact than a larger fee that's just an owner fee. Um, and understanding kind of how those have an impact um, is important because sometimes you might focus on a fee, but it's just not going to have that big of an impact. Whereas another fee, you focus on that, that's going to have a massive impact. But again, it, it's the it's that multiplying effect. Um, and, it, and whenever you're making assumptions, how many tenants am I going to have in each property? How many properties am I going to have? Um, right. It's going to be a monthly fee, quarterly fee, is going to be a one-time fee. All of those things happen, but because we, we deal in larger numbers than a lot of other, uh, especially real estate businesses, and by that one change, lose that needle quite a bit. 
Absolutely. So what I'm getting at is that not all dollars are created equal. A hundred dollars of additional revenue to to service a new client comes with a new cost structure for every new door that you manage. Whereas ten dollars of revenue across all your existing doors, when your cost structure is already covered by your base management fee, all, all the fees that you currently have, that goes straight to the bottom line. That different fees are going to have a different cost structure associated with delivering whatever it is that you're charging for. But a lot of fee opportunities have a very low uh, basis to actually implement. Absolutely. I, I couldn't agree more. I think one of the things we really have a tendency to do in this industry is focus on the top line, where when you really need to look at your cost of goods sold, your cost of acquisition, your cost of operational implementation. And many times you're right. Some fees are going to have almost no cost associated with them, especially if you already have your infrastructure in place. So if you have, uh, you're, you're running a profitable uh, business right now, you uh, have most of your infrastructure covered, and then you're adding and making adjustments in terms of how you generate revenue, that essentially, that, that, those dollars are much more valuable than your first dollars. Um, so anything you do after that is, is very impactful. So yes, you're absolutely right. And the other thing that, that people just forget about is I gotta look at my cost structure. What is that going to do to my actual, um, my actual number in terms of, am I going to have to hire more people? Am I going to have to invest mm -hmm. in technology? What am I going to have to do to implement that? So a lot of times when we kick off this conversation, because everybody's heard of fee maxing, right? If you've been to an ARPM event, you've heard about this fee or that fee. Some folks are still kind of wondering, well, where do I get started? What do you think of as the big kind of buckets or, or categories that a variety of fees could be dropped into? Yeah. Um, so I have a couple of different thoughts in terms of where to start and then how these buckets fall into. One of the things I, I like to know is I like to know my competition, even though sometimes I'm going to make the market in a certain fee because I'm going to, I'm not going to tie my hands by what the competition is doing. However, um, you do want to know what the competition is doing. What is your market going to bear? I can go and say, I want to charge 20% management fee, but if the, <laughs> but there's a good chance that I'm not going to get it no matter what in a given market. Uh, in terms of my buckets, I, I look at them, uh, I break them down into a number of categories and I value different revenue streams differently. Um, and on a side note, if you ever go, if, you, if you're ever contemplating selling your business, recurring revenue is more valuable or valued higher than transactional revenue. Um, or at least you can, you can demand that, that this is a recurring annuity stream. So I'm going to value that recurring revenue higher than I am transactional. When I look at that, I look at my owner, my owner recurring revenue, my tenant recurring revenue, and then my owner um, transactional, and then my tenant transactional. And I really break those down into different buckets um, inside of that. So I will even break things down as what are, what are different service revenue fees that I can have add-on services. Um, for those of you that have a brokerage and um, other entities tied in or a construction company, we might I would tie that in and put it in the bucket of that is essentially a shared service. That is one of my, part of my entity is sharing a service or a, or it's a, 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 you know, we might have a parent company relationship or it's essentially a sibling company relationship. But for the most part, it's really those four main categories, recurring, transactional, split between owner and tenant. All right, so those are some basic. Let's now let's talk about other considerations for implementation. We, we conceptually get it's high leverage, want those dollars. What are the other considerations that would cause somebody to distinguish the relative merits of one category of fee for another, like ease of implementation, ease of collection, et cetera? Yeah, and this is kind of where a few things like operations falls into place. You've got to have, no matter where you fall, if, if your fee is tied around, let's say, moving in and moving out tenants, and that is where you either have to create the fee or um, disable the fee, and there might be something that you have to do in between, then you have to operationalize that. That has to be part of your checklist of what your uh, what your staff does in terms of moving in tenants, moving out tenants. The in in what I see a lot in our consulting practice, probably where we have some of the biggest impact is when we break down operations. We find that a lot of those systems don't don't exist. Um, a lot of staff are or a lot of property managers are doing things from memory or sticky sticky pads. So it's really important to have a very consistent process so that you can have your arms around the business, but you also need a documentation process. So if it, again, if it's a fee that requires an action during a tenant move in, uh, there needs to essentially be that checkbox. If it's an, if, and if it's something in, in the middle, let's say it's a, it's a fine structure, like it's a, um, 
a fine structure for, uh, let's just say a car, you know, extra car, and you actually have a specific fine for that. Well, you've got to be able to have that documentation in your record so that your staff knows to do that. And um, a lot of times, obviously, with a lot of the property management software, things like that, some of those things will automatically get applied. So if you're going to apply a fine, you have to manually go in. But you, you've got to have, OK, every time I have a, a, a lease violation, my staff needs to do these five things. One of those things is mm. fee. And without doing that, um, I've found I found in a lot of companies tens of thousands of dollars a year in lost revenue. To the yeah. charge it. And that's happened over and over and over again. So there's leaking money everywhere in this business. No doubt about it. So part of what I'm hearing you say is just knowing your internal capacity, like being realistic about how much process you can layer in to get that that money. Yeah. Certain fees for the same dollar you can back into a different ways, like maintenance, for example. You could approach it as a vendor marketing fund, which is going to be simpler in terms of collection as opposed to um, um, maintenance markup on each individual invoice. Yeah. Let's talk. Uh, let's talk about some specific fees, man. Yeah. Let's dive right in. So we're going to be looking at a spreadsheet and analysis tool that Michael has put together, really as kind of a, a part of the intake process. So in our consulting practice as well, when you go in to work with the client and you're trying to achieve progress, you have to understand where are we at today. And looking at that on the financial level is really important because that's ultimate bottom line reality. Um, so Michael, can you just give us a little overview and description of, of this tool and how you use yeah, it? Yeah, and I'll uh, share my screen here in just a second. Um, but to give you the high level of what you'll see when we share it, it's, it's broken down in a few different parts. And this is essentially how we approach part, this is part of our financial analysis when, when we go in and look at the finance to one of our property management clients. We will go in and we'll take their current existing fee structure and we'll compare it to one or two other fee structures. So what you'll see is the first thing we'll look at is, well, let's just go take some of the fees that are existing in the industry. It's not gonna have every fee in there, but it's it'll give us a good idea of how to go through the analysis. And then you, we create assumptions and then the assumptions are based on the actual practice and what we typically see in our business. Uh, and you'll see what those are. And then what that will do is it will generate us generate a report of what is going what's going to happen if I'm comparing apples to apples on those assumptions. What's that bottom line revenue right. going to look like? Um, so uh, let me jump in. And this is a, just a forewarning. This is a spreadsheet with a lot of numbers. So <laughs> it will be a little uh, interesting probably to take a look at. So let me go in and share. Uh, I'm going to go grab that window. Okay, so. All right, I'm, I'm going to zoom in a little bit here so that we can uh, make sure. That, Perfect. Yep. Uh, maybe a little bit. Nice and clear. Yeah, make, it could be, uh, if you're on a small screen, maybe a little bit of a challenge, but we'll do our best to, to, to zoom in as, as best we can. So um, the way we start this um, analysis, we essentially start with our two scenarios. So if you can see these two different columns here, we have scenario one and then we have scenario two. Uh, I like to start with the general fees paid to the owner and that's everything from monthly management fee to our lease placement fee or renewal fee, all of the basics. And a lot of these are not necessarily you know, anything magical, but we just wanna see what this difference is going to be in terms of the fee structures that we're comparing. I then I did include when we're doing analysis some of the other random fees like if you charge a paper check fee for owners or if you have an hourly um, court charge things like that we actually don't calculate those uh, or a lot of those what we do is we lump those into an additional revenue number that's an estimate and we'll I'll show you that down at the bottom then on the tenant fee structure um, we look at obviously the, the biggies those are things like tenant application fee if uh, if you happen to have a pet admin fee that the PM, PM keeps. Uh, we list any of the deposits, but again, that's not necessarily money kept by the by the company. Um, any other amenity fees, if you have a one-time lease administrative fee up front at the uh, beginning of a lease term, what kind of impact that would have. Um, again, all the way down to everything from a three-day notice fee and any kind of fine, things like that. Um, then, uh, you know, we've got, a lot of us are real familiar with some of the uh, other vendors in the industry that essentially deliver um, ancillary services to our tenants. And I just put three, uh, three, and then I just put a random one in here that there's another one that are fairly common, you typically uh, hear of, and we've got filter easy, and then you might have within one of the property softwares, if you're essentially doing an administrative fee for 
uh, either renter's insurance or a property protection plan, such as similar to Portfolio, uh, possibly Task Easy. Um, I simplified this for this presentation, but there's quite a few calculations that we do whenever we do an analysis. We actually look at how many times per year does the service get delivered on a monthly basis. Uh, so if you are doing yard mowing, you're probably going to have 24 instances or even more <clears throat> of that particular um, of that particular instance. Um, then you then I basically will then go in and calculate. Well, what is my estimated participation of my tenants from a pool? Am I going to have 100 percent participation or 60 percent? Right. So when we really when we actually do the analysis with um, with clients, it we actually this number changes a little bit because that that profit number will adjust based on our participation levels. Uh, so, but for the purposes of this, it was probably a lot simpler just to kind of list. Okay, here's what I've lost. You know, say this is the profit right here, and then down here, what you see is this miscellaneous revenue. This is one of the few few times we have to just kind of rely on our uh, experience and history is what is the difference in these other ancillary revenues? So if you're adding a bunch of different fees, such as uh, check fees, trip fees, penalty fees that you didn't have before, or you're comparing the two, then you're obviously gonna see a jump uh, in that random, you know, that miscellaneous fee. And again, that's a little tough to, to kneel down because it's very hard to determine specifically on every single instance. So in that one, I do like to do a general bucket based just generally on um, on experience and I calculate that as a percentage of rent roll. And again, that's a high, high level estimate. The next part, so this first step obviously is to get these two fee structures down and take a look at two different ones. So I've basically put in some dummy data in here, two different fee structures. Um, one, you know, there's a lot of fees that aren't being charged. And um, the other one, there's a lot of fees being charged, the fees maximization uh, as you will. And then the next thing is to put in assumptions. This is where a lot of the analysis comes in. This is the, the assumptions numbers are really, really important because that's going to drive how often and how impactful the fees you actually have in your fee structure are going to be under your scenarios. Um, starting with the very, very easy thing like average rents, uh, your vacancy, uh, how many units uh, of your portfolio, how many units have a work order every month? Uh, is it 25%? Is it 20%? Is it 15%? If you don't know that number, um, it's, you may have to estimate that number, but uh, knowing that number is actually pretty powerful. Then our average work order amount um, here. And so, again, looking up your average work order amount might be 250, might be 350, might be something along those lines. The, um, um, the reason we put this in this calculation is because these two assumptions, we're going to basically we plug in an algorithm, essentially, or a formula that looks at your portfolio, says, OK, every month I'm going to have 25 percent to have a work order. The average work order is two hundred fifty dollars. Well, what's my maintenance markup fee? And that's going to plug that. In. Right. So that's why these numbers and assumptions are important. Same thing with the uh, number of applications per uh, lease or placement. How many applications am I going to have? And we feed that data off of that. What are uh, how many? What do we estimate our average placements going to be this month? Um, the application cost to the PM. What percentage have pets? Um, this is one that's kind of a fun scenario that I like is the average uh, tenants who have late fees along with what's their average, how many days are they typically late? So if I look at my pool of late fees, what's the average that they're going to actually pay? And the reason that number is important is over here in our late fees, I essentially, what I, I put in our algorithm is essentially what is our first day fee? And I know that some people do a percentage, but um, we can we can model that, but I just for simplicity sake, I mean, uh, flat amounts. But I put in first uh, day fees and then our ongoing day fees after that. And then what it, what day is the fee late? And what this actually does is it tells you which is going to be the greater revenue driver in that model. And I've seen really, really big swings uh, and impact by this number right here, which is the day that the fee is late. That has actually had a very, very significant impact um, in quite a few different models that we've run. Um, and then um, annual growth rate, we, we want to know how, how much are we growing every um, year. And the reason we're going to do that is because we want to know how many units are we, if we're growing at 20% in a year, how many units are we adding in a given month? And that, that tells me how many owner or property setup fees I'm going to have if we're charging that. So there's a lot of calculation that goes into it. And we also want to know the percentage of at expiration, percentage of renewals, relists, and how many might get lost during that period. Um, so those are all the assumptions in this main area. So that's a lot. And just, and this is our start fee structure assumption. Um, right. Because all that makes sense. <laughs> that's a lot of, that's a lot of. Data. Yeah, that is, a, that is a lot of information. All right. So, so guys, here's what we're doing. We're trying to quantify the opportunity. What we're saying here is 
what are you doing now? What could you be doing? What is the gap? So let's actually walk through this on an individual company basis, right? We're going to talk about Acme property management company, and let's just go ahead and use some 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 financial assumptions powered by the benchmarking study that we did. So let's assume the average the average revenue per unit that we found in the financial benchmarking study that we released was a hundred and sixty four dollars one six four so let's see if we can manipulate a set of underlying assumptions to approach a revenue per door a revenue per unit of around a hundred and sixty four dollars and then do some modifications to try and break through that to get closer to two hundred dollars two hundred dollars per unit and see what the difference um, to the bottom line is. So one hundred sixty four so our annual amount on that would be nineteen sixty eight. All right. So, um, so just looking from our baseline and we can go back and again, manipulate the two numbers. This is where all the math starts kicking in here. Um, and this is, we'll assume, um, but basically the, the per unit numbers will stay the same. It doesn't really matter on a unit. So I just threw 350 units under management, um, calculated the occupancy rate, the average new property and properties under management, how many placements and rules. So all of those fee assumptions that we had in the first scenario brings us to uh, 22, um, 2229 in our annual revenue per unit and this uh, this other model that we threw in pretty much all of the fees is 3720. So Jordan, what do we want to use on our assumptions for our average rent? What would what uh, is similar to the study that would be is 1500 a pretty good marker? Yeah, you know, we, that's not actually even something I have handy. Um let yeah, let's let's roll with 1500. So um, if we go over here and, we, and we're looking, so what we're already seeing is that first fee structure is, is greater than what um, the per door unit we, number we were looking at. So if we go over here and let's use this first column for um, that scenario, Acme essentially. So we can manipulate a lot of numbers that are gonna have a impact. So if it's uh, 7%, 70, let's say we, um, uh let's look here let's say we're doing on average let's say they're doing a three percent markup versus ten percent no let's do, let's say no, let's say no mar maintenance markup okay, no ma for example that's a pretty yeah no maintenance markup that's a pretty ubiquitously neglected and as a side note this is just area. um to be just on the markup of maintenance it's one that i've found has the least amount of impact in terms of bottom line if just as a side note it's um it's not really a huge needle mover uh, looking at where we can reduce our revenue or per door, our additional revenue per door. Uh, well, hey, hey, man, you put it out there. Let's not gloss over that. Are you saying that because of the actual volume of dollars associated with it or because of some kind of a implementation cost? Um, yeah. So I, when we look at it and we look at the multiplication of everything that we can do, your multiplication essentially is all of my units times 25% every month. So let's say I've got... Uh, 400 units that basically means i'm only dealing with 100 units per month um if my average work order is let's say 100 units my average work order let's say is 200 dollars uh, just to make the math easier 300 dollars let's say that is what that gives us what 30,000 in revenue um in order to be doing 30,000 in or 30,000 in maintenance costs every month that's a decent sized company um you know you might have you know, anywhere from, oh, I'd say, let's say, let's say you're 250 to 400 units, depending on how, what your portfolio looks like. Um, and if you're doing a 10% markup, which you don't typically always get that with everyone, that's a hard one to negotiate. It's on the higher end. Yeah. 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 So let's say you're $3,000 a month. I mean, that's, that's not nothing, but when you look at a $36,000 a year increase in revenue, that's a great thing. But when I compare it to some of the, in the when I compare it to the power of some of the other ones that I can piggyback on things we're either already doing or on, on the lease structure, then it, it's, it's not that it doesn't have an impact. It just has a disproportionately lower impact than a lot of the other ones. So whenever we look at, okay. whenever we look at one that we're going to start, I'm going to start with some of the other ones first, uh, especially the ones that um, I can just implement right away that will, um, you know, they take time to kick in, but, um, ones that aren't going to be anything, aren't going to be an argument, aren't going to be anything like that. And we can discuss this a little bit later is selling it to owners. I mean, some owners, 
it's funny because owners get so hung up on the maintenance markup, but the reality is for us as PMs, it's usually not the big um, game changer that some of the other ones are. So if I'm going to give up one revenue one, it would probably be that. Although, um, although I don't necessarily think you should, but if I'm, if I'm going to be forced and someone's going to twist my arm, which one are you going to give up? That's going to be the one. So and just to be clear, this, this model here assumes zero cost basis for the ongoing administration of these fees, correct? Uh, yes and no. So what we're looking at here is strictly revenue. But then when we get into our profitability analysis, which is at the bottom, we'll, we can go into this in depth in, in, if you like. Um, we essentially feed these two scenario numbers into a profitability analysis. So if I take a look and let's say I'm running at a 20% profit margin my and I'm generating essentially this revenue, $60,000 per unit. So that puts us about a couple thousand dollars, which is not terribly far off from your studies numbers. Um, so what I would, what we do is we start with, let's make an assumption of across the board, new fee, old fee, all fees of 20% profit margin. And then um, that gives us a profit margin of $144,000 on this particular scenario. What we then do is we do a backwards calculation of, um, we essentially do a backward calculation of the impact or the new profit margin based on the additional revenue. So because we're essentially in these, if we assume a zero um, added cost, um, this calculated additional revenue on these two structures, because these are exactly the same scenario, it jumps to 55% if you implement all those fees. And again, this is if it's across the entire portfolio. That's not always realistic, but if I'm going to compare the apples to apples, that's what I want to do. To your point, though, what we have to do is look at, am I going to need to implement um, any new operational procedures, staff, uh, or anything along those lines, or, or can I gain efficiency somewhere else in order to basically balance that out? We can model pretty easily, well, let's assume any new money above this $724, any additional dollar, we can, we, can apply, um, uh, we can apply a certain overhead to each one of those. And we can even do it in a, on a, a line item by line item basis. So you can do that. What, I, what I've found, mainly because we go in and we kind of work with everything all along the way, <laughs> we kind of take everything. If we can gain some existing operational efficiency while we are implementing these fees, um, I don't think I've ever had one. Actually, I've yet to have one where they had to add, say, staff. Um, what they have had to add is procedures. And again, that's only because we, we do the operational piece along with this as well. And we try to trim that down. Um, in a couple of scenarios, we even reduce staff at the same time. So it's kind of a, uh, it's a, lot of the, a lot of the times I'll just to keep it even, I'll look at, well, what is just that? What would that just additional revenue do for my profit margin? Awesome. Let's let's go back and keep modeling it out based on the revenue per unit figure that I, that I gave yep. you so we can really kind of grok the, the impact here. All right. So let's um, I'm going to tweak a couple of numbers to see if we can't get that down to I'm going to actually lower our average rent because I think nationally um, you're probably lower than that fifteen hundred, I would guess. So I think that's probably I would guess so, too. Yeah, I'm going to um, I don't know that off, but off the top of my head. So we're at about nineteen forty nine. Yeah. We're pretty close. Yeah, that comes out to roughly pretty close to your number on an annual basis. Does that sound about right? Yep. Yeah. Okay. So our per door. So then if you look at the comparison, the nice thing is we look at this comparison and go, all right, well, if I'm going to go change these structures. It, again, in real life, we understand it's, you're not going to snap your fingers and then every property you have managed is going to be on the new structure. Um, but again, it tells you, well, going forward, what am I going to do? Um, we have, uh, we essentially did, we went, we went pretty high, we went 10%, 100% uh, on renewals, or 100% on replacement, 250 on renewals. We added a new account setup fee, uh, maintenance markup. Uh, these other random fees here actually don't get calculated. They're lumped into that miscellaneous percentage down at the bottom. Okay. Uh, we have a $60 tenant app monthly. Uh, we actually do a monthly administrative fee for cuts. Um, actually, it's higher than that. Um, then we have, we even just threw in a monthly amenity fee along with um, leasing fee, a one time leasing fee at the beginning, some paper check fees, things like that. But these are the ones that typically go into one of the calculations along with our late rent. So in the two scenarios, we compared $70 and $70 on the first day and $60 on the first day of being late. And then on the late fees on daily thereafter, we did 15 and 25. Uh, we then made the change of, well, let's do in scenario one, let's say we let them be late on the fifth. What happens if we've been changing to the third? Um, knowing that our average tenant is late nine days. Um, mm -hmm. This doesn't account behavioral changes this might have across the portfolio, but 
Sure. That's, sure. that's very hard to model unless you get into sociology, and I am not qualified for that. <laughs> yeah. Um, and then we basically added in some of these ancillary revenue um, items per month. Uh, in, in, in. And then assuming with all of those other fees, we get to about 1.25% of rent roll to get to absorb all of those additional uh, fine fees and transactional fees that we have. And I usually see anywhere from one in one to 2% um, jump whenever they implement, not necessarily every single fee like this, but I typically will see a jump to somewhere in that range, one to 2% of rent roll once it's rolled out. Sometimes in, in, in some cases it's even higher than that. Uh, so that would, that bring, brought our assumption here to, uh, instead of 56,000 in revenue, it brings it to 103,000 in revenue. Um, part of that is going to be, again, our ancillary revenue down here. Um, our late fees, real interesting. Look at the difference with the late fees. Just those tweaks in that, and if you use the same baseline um, assumptions, it's essentially a 61% increase in late fee revenue just by making those minor tweaks. So that's that's actually one of the more impactful ones I've seen over time as well. Uh, you know, instead of instead of going over each one right here, let's take a look at what the differences are. We have management revenue was uh, 13,000, a 42% difference. Uh, same thing with tenant placement, and those all run for 33 to 42% difference. Um, in the ones where there was essentially none before, it's it just it gives a zero. But the reality is, it's essentially you know whatever you want to put. If you put a dollar amount on it, it's a four thousand percent increase. It just didn't exist before. Um, mm -hmm. uh, late fees increased sixty one percent, and then we had a four hundred percent increase on the additional revenue, and that brings us to a difference of forty six thousand or eighty one percent in terms of those two portfolios looking at each other side to side. Um, and they, again, that's top line revenue that then feeds over into our uh, differences here. It moves the needle about to 55.9%. Well, what's interesting is, is that's the actual profit margin. But when you look at the actual change, so our change in our, our change, the percentage that we've changed that number, the, that percentage, our annual re re revenue, we see it change to 81.4%. But the, but the percent change in your profit was 179%. And that means you essentially almost tripled what your, um, what your profit margin was. And then on your actual dollar profit, it's actually on 400% dollar profit. This obviously is a fairly extreme example from going really low to really high. Um, we've made these assumptions very wide. Most of our assumptions aren't quite that dramatic because usually most people are charging most of those fees already. Um, and then sometimes they don't implement, they don't want to implement necessarily every fee because it just doesn't fit in their market. So this is a bit of a, a pretty dramatic example, um, but it does illustrate the power of the exponential power of these minor changes. I think, and like I said, the late fee example to me is probably one of the largest um, and most impactful examples in the entire thing because we make such minor changes that it, you know, it's not like we came in and started charging $200 late fees and $100 a day. We made a very minor modification between the two, and it just had this cascading effect um, throughout the uh, throughout the entire uh, calculation. Um, we did throw in just a couple of graphs here. And I'll zoom out just a tad, just so you can visually see. When we visually look at um, where and how, how that revenue had an impact, we were able to categorize um, what in what the difference in all of the difference um, where the where the money was basically allocated to? Um, usually, I'll throw a pie chart. I didn't throw one on this particular one, but a lot of times I'll throw a pie chart up. And when I'm working with a client, we'll go and start tackling. Okay, does that top percentage change? Is that going? On? We're going to look at that change. Number. Let's tackle that one first if it makes sense. Uh, sometimes the ease of implementation of some of the other ones is puts them in front of something else. But we start as uh, quickly as possible. Uh, and again, here we show the difference in our profit here. It's a pretty good graphical depiction of that. One of the other things, uh, well, we get to this, Jordan, do you have uh, any questions on you know, anything I need to highlight you think and point it and zoom in? I know we've kind of jumped around a lot. Um, well, so let's just, uh, did we cover bottom line profit impact, the actual net net increase from scenario one to scenario two? Yep, so that that's what this is down here essentially. So we have our annual revenue difference. Um, we, we have to make an assumption of what our profit margin is unless we have actual numbers from our client. And if we have our actual number and their actual profit margin, we'll plug it in. 
Um, so if they are running at a 20% profit margin, but we add that additional revenue without adding overhead, that does jump our profit from $136,000 under the scenario to 691. Again, probably not a very typical example, um, but- Sure, um, sure. Let's, can we drop that that 20% down to 10%? Absolutely. Drop that. And so we go, we go from All here, right. yep. And, and the reason why okay. this number is not as big is because we basically only piggyback on this profit margin already. So we're, we're adding it to what this is. It's actually why you see a, a profit margin drop here because the first dollars were less profitable. But that's fine. It's still a huge, okay. huge impact. But let's also assume half of what we're talking about is utter, utter hogwash, right? Yeah. Let's like the, make the most generous assumption possible. Chop the number in half. What is the percentage improvement to our profit margin? So if we take that 623, let's say 623, subtract um, 68 from it. Let's say 623 minus 68 equals 555. So that's the improvement. Divide that in half and we'll call it 275. So 68 divided by 275. No, it'd be the other way, other way around. Am I, am I doing that right here? I'm trying to figure out 275 is how much, is what, what, what uh, percentage of improvement off of 68? So uh, 275, uh, that would be, that would still be about a 400% improvement. Um, essentially, if you cut that wow. particular scenario in half, yeah, if you go from 10% um, and, and and the jump from here to, to here, if they're operating at a 10% profit margin, there's one of two things happening. If they're in still growing early, obviously, um, and they've just kind of come into, they've just kind of go, gone to the profitability um, threshold, they might still be at that. But as you saw from your study, that's actually not a, not a very untypical number at all. Uh, yeah, exactly. And so the other thing that's probably happening is kind of what we see in this scenario, either inconsistency of fee structure, but on the other side, it's probably, in my opinion, probably more operationally based than anything else. Um, so uh, in when we, again, when we get into specifics with specific clients, we, we drill into that because we look into how, how are you handling leasing? How are you um, handling inspections and staffing? Are you outsourcing or insourcing? How are you handling, handling maintenance? All of those different things will impact how these fees um, work together and just I won't go into this but what we do is we take these numbers and these assumptions and we take what we think we want our new assumption to be what we do is we then plug in our inputs of well um, I want to go now and look at um, gosh, way zoomed out we build our model we look at our human resources numbers and this is our units per employee based on what we think we're going to have in terms of um, who we need to hire at what stage then we look at our technology cost. We add that into the mix, and then we build in the marketing and advertising cost for the. And this is a 24-month analysis, which then ultimately takes us into our template analysis of our P&L for 24 months. What this lets us do is to actually get real granular to, okay, well, let's take a look at your rent. Is that going to stay the same? Is your um, advertising cost going to stay the same? Is your what's your payroll going to do? What's your bookkeeping cost? Because some of those numbers are going to increase as you grow. And we calculate in everything from our, our units under management to our churn rate to um, what we, you know, how much money are we spending? So how many new properties are we coming on based on spend and other activities? And we take all of those, all of those, and then we calculate how they impact this this scenario. One of the and one of the challenging things when we do that is whenever we're doing that with an existing company that's changing their existing fee structure, we have to build in a lag. Um, and it's so by building in that lag, we uh, that gives us the ability to show how that fee ramps up because a lot of these fees, whether it's a new owner fee, whether it's a new tenant fee, there you have to kind of go through the renewal or expiration process, or you, know, you have to either have an expiration management agreement, go negotiate new fees, what, or if you're even going to do that with your existing owners, you know, a lot of times it makes more sense to just grandfather the owners in um, that are under that exact yeah. structure. So that's a that's a very that's a question that a lot of uh, um, that you have to answer and how you're going to handle those as well. So let's pivot now to talking about implementation, right? Yep. Um, so those of you that are in 
that are still here in the chat window, love to hear any, any reasons why this won't work, why there's problems with these fees, you can't implement, et cetera. The, the thing that comes to mind for me, Michael, is this distinction between the owner hat yeah. versus the operator hat. The operator hat wants to work hard, grind, get a nice paycheck. That owner hat is only compensated on the basis of the accretion of the value of the underlying equity or owner distributions. That's the only way you as an owner of this asset gets paid. What we're talking about doing here is advocating for the owner by forcing the operator to focus on improving the underlying business model and the underlying business engine. That's why it's so high leverage, but there's there's some, some resistance that comes to this. Let's walk through some of the resistance. It could be, yep. can't do that, all my file, all my owners will fire yep. me. Um, uh, there's, a, there's laws prohibiting that here. Or, um, you know, there's, there's a long laundry, laundry list of implementation pushback. Walk me through some of those examples and how you approach those. Yep. So um, I think you're, you, you touched on the very first thing that I would probably just make sure and, and we do, um, we do put this back into our clients' um, um, laps and their attorneys and say, if anything up here is not allowed in your state, don't do it. <laughs> so that's number one. Right. Got so to make sure what our limitations inside of each state are. Um, we are not, although I'm a, I'm a non-practicing attorney, I re I'm a recovering attorney, um, I don't practice in every state. So we put that back into, go talk to your attorney. If there's anything in here that you just want to make sure is okay in your state, most of them are, but you do have different states with different nuanced rules that um, you need to make sure that you're, you're abiding by. So that's number one. Um, number two, um, absolutely. You know, I, I look at the general philosophy in, in how you're going to explain or um, talk about a fee, whether it's to an owner or a tenant. The tenant fees are nice because you just implement them at renewal, expiration, relist, and uh, new leases. So by doing that, you just, over the course of a year or two, that's basically gonna, whatever you're doing, generally is gonna work itself in. Um, I'll come back to selling those in a minute, but with the owner, I always want to, to the best that I can, I wanna be able to tie the fee to what, how it helps me provide the owner with the service that they want. Um, that's, and that goes from everything to my base management fee, to my renewal fee, to my, um, uh, to let's say, maintenance markup, anything like that. So sometimes elite late fees are another one where owners don't, I run into this quite a bit where the owners don't understand why they don't, they, they don't keep the late fees. Well, what I do is when we try to explain that is I tie it to everything else. Like, listen, I can't, I can't operate a business on a shoestring budget and you don't want to put one of your most valuable assets to somebody who's operating on a budget where they can't make money. Right? Right. They can't hire the staff, they can't have the tools, they can't do anything that they, they can't do what they need to if they're not generating the revenue to have the staff and infrastructure to take care of your most expensive, your, your most valuable asset. And that's what you're doing for the clients. But then I like to kind of drill back into each one if they have a if they have a specific objection, and one such on late fees. You know, they say, "Well, why why late fees? Why why don't I get? It? You know, I'm the one that's going to have to pay my mortgage late if I don't get the rent payment." And that's that's all good and well, but I have an infrastructure in place to perform rent collections, and we have an incentive to go collect the the rent on time in order to generate one. It's an incentive for us to generate revenue, but two, it's um, it gives us the revenue to be able to have the infrastructure to do it. I mean, that's basically the bottom line. And almost everybody I've talked to, whenever I've sold this, and again, I'm, uh, you know, we, this is, this is my sales style whenever I'm talking to property owners is, is just explain to them, I'm in business, you're in business, these are uh, fair fees, we're gonna deliver a superior product based on what we do. And by delivering that, that product, your, your, your asset's going to do better in the long run. Um, that's generally my sales pitch. And I'm just honest. I tell people so on certain fees, sometimes with a, if, let's say if I charge a monthly pet administrative fee to the tenant, but we keep it versus the owner, um, I quite honestly just tell the owner, it's, it's again, it, we're in business to make money. And so it's, it's a profit. There's nothing wrong with telling the owner that I'm in business to make a profit. Um, that being said, when the best that you can look at, well, what is it that you can identify that you do? What's your process that is different than everyone else's? Or how are you more efficient than someone else? And highlight that. If you have a collections process that uses a great level of technology, right. highlight that and say, right. we have a better technology. Our process is better. If we, you know, so find those bullet points that you can use with each of those fees 
and always turn it to a selling point because any increase in fee could be turned into a selling point if you are actually doing it. Um, and that's, I've, I've never really had a problem if I approach it that way. That being said, in your market, not every fee is gonna be exactly the same and not every every fee is going to match exactly. You, you may be in a market where 10% is just never gonna happen. You, and so you have to work within the constraints of your specific market, but get the most that you can out of your market for your business. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So let's talk about positioning. This is kind of related to positioning. And there's this whole conversation about fee maxing as well as outsourcing. I do not believe that it is a strategic, sustainable, long-term business play to try and raise revenue and lower costs. It's too fat, it's too much bacon. Eventually, somebody is gonna be willing to sacrifice margin for your market share. What I do believe is that the margin that you get in the, in the interim, in the near term, can absolutely be used to drive the organization, the asset, and the overall service quality forward. So a lot of this conversation is related to what is the ambition of the level of service that you want to provide your end customers? If you want to maintain or maybe even lower service and charge people more, you can implement this stuff, but long-term things don't bode well for you. So talk to me about just some of the positioning implications and some of those intangibles that are related to this. Yeah, so um, th that's, I think, a really, really important point because, um, you know, when you look at the positioning of the different types of fees um, and what, like you, what you said is, when you look at your, um, this discussion between outsourcing versus um, raising fees and maximizing that, there's, there, there's some value there, but at the same time, there's also some really significant pitfalls and landmines if you aren't careful. Um, because sometimes when you, it's not, I'm not, I'm not hundred percent against outsourcing. What I am against is outsourcing relationships and outsourcing what I, mm -hmm. if, if I, if I have something that is a truly administrative task that doesn't really have a high touch on either my tenants or my owners, um, I, I don't want to outsource that relationship. I might use technology to automate it. Um, if, and the best that I can use technology to automate that that piece without outsourcing, I'd rather do that. But that's not to completely say outsourcing is not the way to do it. Um, there are tasks that might make sense, but it's not a outsourcing is not in property management is not a business model in terms of an entire business model. And I and I don't have anything mm -hmm. against it. And I, and I actually there are things we outsource. Um, it's just you have to be very careful not to sacrifice relationship and quality. Because when it comes down to it, at the end of the day, we have to remember we're dealing with people's most valuable asset. And if they feel like they are in, in a just a, some kind of widget factory and the person who they're dealing with doesn't even work for you or you're the person you hired, I think that's right. some trouble. But for, for a lot of tasks, for, for back end administrative tasks, it's fine. But quite frankly, the technology exists now where we can automate a lot of that. Um, and so, so, that so, so on this point, my, my view here, Michael, and I'm curious to get your take on this. My view is that cost cutting is a strategy mm -hmm. in so much as you are operating a low cost model as your overall playbook. Yeah. If, if broadly you're trying to charge as little as possible, make as little as possible, yeah. land and expand, add doors at a, at a, a lightning pace, you know, runner's warehouse would, would potentially be um, archetypical of that notion. That's a business model. But if that's not your game and you're trying to either maintain or raise your fees and lower costs, don't conflate that with, with a, a big picture business strategy. That's just a, a near term tactic and eventually the market will pick up on that. Yeah, and I, and I would say probably our clients mainly fall within that. If you look at that middle range service offering up to high level and premium service offering, ours probably range from about a notch or two from the middle all the way up to the premium. Um, because what they're looking to do is have a sustainable model that delivers such a high level of service that they are able to have a sustainable business. Because um, we haven't really talked about cost as much, but your loss of properties will be the most costly thing that you will have if you don't perform all along the way. Um, when you look at not only your cost of acquisition, but your lost revenue and lost opportunity, when you lose a property that you had spent time effort to get that acquisition cost and to get that property under management and then you lose that you've basically lost twice you've lost the acquisition you've lost the future revenue and you 
And not only have you lost twice, you may have lost, if your average hold time is say eight years, you've lost eight times. So um, that cost is significant. So I would rather build sustainable business models that deliver sustainable superior service so that they can they can maintain that. And again, one of the things about our industry is that we are, you know, we're, we're maturing slowly, but we've come a long way in the last, I'd say three to four years. And that's again, that's from some of the, the partners that have come into the industry and created Brentley. I'm a huge, huge fan of Brentley. That's changed the business. It's changed the financial model in price and cost and efficiency of stolen properties. Is it going to work in every single market? Not every market, but it works pretty well in most places. Most. It is. That has been one that's been a complete game changer. They came in and the entire industry has shifted in how they do business. Those types of things are what are going to allow us as property managers and in this industry to be able to continue to evolve and build on our profit margin without um, without sacrificing quality. And it, what, on top of that is where, well, how do I operationalize that? And that's a whole nother webinar. <laughs> so yeah. there's yeah. a whole lot of ways. Absolutely. Uh, webinar, but that's, that's, you know, operationalizing your fees and your service offering is just as important as your fee structure. But starting with that fee structure and knowing what is what am I going to get out of it? How am I going to position it? How am I going to be the best in the industry at it? That's how you do it. Mm -hmm. And that, it all. I, I, I one of my one of the things I always say is everything impacts everything. That statement will impact your marketing materials. How what am I going to put on my marketing materials? So everything in property management impacts the entire workflow, and entire process of property management. And if you get them all working together in all those different stages, you've got a great business. Yeah, yeah, man, I, I love it. I'm, I'm with you on that. You know, if we're just going to take this really high level, here's what I would say. Like many things in life, this is about, it's about your intention. It's about what problem would you rather solve for? Would you rather solve for offering better service at the same margins that you currently have? Or would you rather solve for figuring out how to improve the business model, creating more margin, finding ways um, through through fee maximization and ancillary fees. We're not here to say it's easy, there's no challenges, your owners won't notice. We're asking the question, what is a more worthwhile problem to solve for? And what is your intention around profit within your business? Are you still believing, are you one of those folks that's buying into the notion that I'm not, I don't have a lot of profit to show for now, but someday in the future, when I grow, at scale, that's when the dollars are going to come. Maybe, maybe not. Good luck. My belief, what I've seen, Michael, I know, I know you're coming from the same place, is that profit comes from discipline, and the dis the time for discipline is now. Not to delay that. Not to say I'm not going to have discipline now. I'm not going to work out now. I'm not going to treat my body well now. But ten years from now, I'm going to flip a switch. It's going to be great. It's going to be a cash machine. Probably not. That's my macro commentary on your willingness to explore and think about the implementation of these fees. I do want to transition now to talk about some of the questions from the audience. Guys, if you have questions, answer them right now. Get as granular as we want as you want. We're going to go through these questions one by one. The first question comes from Doji. That is this. Do you disclose all your miscellaneous fees to the owner? Uh, that's a really good question. It, it, it really depends on it's there partially, partially I leave that up to the client, but what my recommendation typically is, is I like to, the ones that are probably going to have a big impact, I might individualize individually, um, disclose, um, the big ones, especially the big ones that are directed to the owner, but the, even the tenant side fees, I, it, sometimes it's hard to say, well, I'm going to itemize everything because the, the, the minute I add a fee or make a change on the tenant side, I've, if I've only limited to those itemized ones, then now I'm kind of in a little bit of a little bit of an issue because I haven't disclosed it on the management agreement and I'm adding a new one. Am I required to go back and have them re-sign an amended management agreement? What I like to do is um, pick, a, pick some of the ones that I feel are important that I should disclose and then um, include language that says we retain the right to charge basically tenants any, any fee we deem necessary um, in the management of the of the um, of the property, that way it leaves that door open, so that if I do make changes down the road or adjustments to my lease, I don't have to go back and re-execute the entire new management agreement. I'm a very big believer in be as transparent as possible. I would rather everyone know exactly up front what I'm doing and why I'm doing it, 
so that there's no questions along the way. At the same time, I, you know, that you balance that with, I'm not going to talk myself out of a sale. Um, and I will, use, that's why I like listing examples. Here's an example, Mr. Owner, uh, something that we charge a tenant, we charge a monthly tenant, we charge the tenant a monthly pet fee. The reason we do is one, it's a gen revenue generator and dealing with the barking dog in the middle of the night is a pain. So we're going to charge that. Um, but you are, we're also going, we also suggest that we're going to charge a non-refundable pet fee that we put you, the tenant's going to pay you at move in or what, however you do that. That's just a one example of how you can do it. But yeah, more disclosure is better, but just be, um, don't be afraid of what you're doing. Um, as long as you're being very upfront as possible as you can. Great answer. Next question from Jason Bischoff. Do you offer discounted management fees to property owners with multiple units? Uh, good question. Um, you know, it, it, it's, it's kind of like if, if you're in Sunday school and someone asks you a question and you know what the answer should be, <laughs> but in reality, you don't always do what you should do in Sunday school. So I could, I'm going to give you the Sunday school answer. Um, but in reality, it's, it doesn't really always work out that way. So I would say, um, I would, I, I, I try not to, to discount services. Um, but in many cases, if it is over say 10, 20, 30 properties, will I discount? Um, what I'm going to try to do is find the ones, the fees that, that hurt less, um, but still impact will still be beneficial to that owner. And so, you know, I would rather waive a, a setup fee or waive a, um, some one kind of the real valuable ones, but it's the end of the day, if you charge your retail clients 10% and someone comes to you with 30 properties and they say, I want eight. Um, and that's going to get, that's going to be the difference between you getting the deal and not, I'm not going to, I'm not going to advise someone not to negotiate the discount, but what you, what you need to do is do some analysis. What's your cost of managing those properties? I've taken on 50, 60, 70, 70 doors at a time, yeah. and I regretted it every day after because I negotiated way too low. I gave up way too much and the owner was a pain and just sucked the life out of my staff. And when I looked at how much I made on those 50 properties, I made more on 10 that I was doing on an individual retail basis. So there's nothing wrong with doing that, but make sure what you're what you're getting into and how much of an impact that's going to have. Because there may be a point where you want to go so low that you're you're out of the deal. Be 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 ready to walk away because if they go way too low. We've heard we've heard this over and over again. Those often are the ones that you end up firing anyway. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So so three things come to mind for me. The first is qualify, know what your minimum rent is that you're willing to manage and stick to it. So get real clear on the overall, just global types of clients that you accept and be dogmatic about that. If somebody passes that filter, it's safer to negotiate because the truth is how you negotiate sets the long-term tone for the relationship. Either I defended and established my value on the front side or I caved easily. And lastly, have a schedule. If, if the multiple property owner um, consideration is something you're, you're worried about, Create the schedule up front and say, yes, absolutely. Here's the schedule. If you have 10 properties, it's X. If you have more than 20, it's X. It's easier to standardize that as opposed to making it one-off negotiation. As soon as the savvy owner smells that there is a bit of, of some flex there, they're going to push. Yeah, the one thing, Follow up oh, question. Sorry, Jordan. Just a, one thing you had mentioned really uh, reminded me of something you had mentioned. This is why it's so important to track your revenue and your profit per door. And when you go in and you take what you're negotiating with that owner and you plug it in, and if it moves that needle beyond where you're comfortable, it moves your revenue per door down and your profit per, per door down. If it's having an imp a negative impact on that and it moves that needle a certain way, that's why it's so important to track that. Because if your practice as a whole starts dipping below a certain point, you're, you're, you're taking on less profitable doors every time you take on a, on a door. So track your, it's, it's critical, critical that you track your revenue per door and your profit per door or your loss per door if you're growing, but either one. Question from Matthew Kamire. Considering every change impacts all aspects of the business, how often do you make changes to fees and processes, et cetera? Uh, I try not to do it very often. Um, consistency of consistency of process, consistency of fees is, is really important. Um, I would probably, I like to limit it to once or twice a year. If there's a really, really compelling reason, um, then and it's maybe a new offering that we can review, and it's it's a really impactful one. Um, those types of fees, I try not. Uh, in general, I try not to change, make massive changes to the fee structure. 
Uh, I'm, I'm not as concerned with something, let's say I'm gonna add an ancillary service to the tenants and I can implement that into the process um, really well because that's not gonna have a wholesale impact on everybody across the board. Um, so I don't mind that as much, but what I wanna make sure are things like, I don't have you know, 200 um, late fee structures throughout the whole, um, throughout my portfolio. Fortunately with technology, some of that's automated, and, but at the same time, it's, you know, having that consistency, there's a lot to be said. So I would say for your main fee structure, try to limit it to once a year. Um, and this, this other part, uh, this other thing I'd like to say is, um, percentages are good in a, in a lot of ways in terms of how you charge some of your main fees. And the reason why is, especially on your management fee, I, I became a, fee, a fan more of uh, percentage versus uh, flat. And that is, again, because you need to participate in your inflation. What that does is it automatically increases my fee structure with inflation um, without me having to go renegotiate and change my fees, my management agreement, all that. So mm -hmm. in, in those times, whenever I'm able to tie that to rent amount, that's great. You can't do that with every fee or you can, but the reality is, um, you know, a lot, the industry practice on a lot of fees is basically a flat fee. But you know, with some clients we've even considered in, a, in an inflationary environment, we've considered looking at taking that renewal fee and making it instead of a flat fee, make it a percentage of the rent. Um, and that way it, I, I am going to give myself a raise if I believe we're in an inflationary um, environment with rents. So a lot of that kind of depends on what you do. But again, we don't do that in every step. But for me on the main fee, I've actually gone from, you know, yeah, flat fee is great and I can sell it really well and I get a lot of owners, but I like a percentage because I don't want to go back and have to sell in two or three years, sell or raise by 30% because rents have gone up 10% a year for the last three years. I don't want to do that. Love it. All right, guys, we are out of time. Greg, I see your questions about filter easy and task easy. I'll message you in Facebook, Monica. I think we did answer your question about tenant fees. Others are charging. Um, Michael, thanks for coming on. Bunch of great information. For those of you that want a copy of the uh, a modified version of the fee analysis tool that Michael was using, we're going to upload that to the Facebook group so you can see that online. This recording will also be uploaded over there. Michael, if folks want to learn a little bit more about RentBridge and the work, work that you do, what's the best place for them to go? Uh, if you just go to rentbridgegroup.com, you can go and just hit contact us and you basically put in your information we'll shoot you an email and give you a, in our email we'll have a scheduling link for if you want to talk with us and you just get pick a time and we'll uh we'll jump on a zoom call and uh just see if there's any way we can help you all right well guys um this was a blast i love talking profit and numbers with up here that gets it and is passionate thank you for being on this crowdcast we'll see you guys on the flip side